Coming up on DTNS, Discord pivots away from gaming, an algorithm to make you more polite, and 3D print your fake meat. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 30th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the rainy forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. Uh, I am not in a forest, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were uh, just talking about messaging and how difficult it is sometimes because everybody wants to be messaged in a different way. Uh, if you want to get that conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Users of Airtel, Vodafone, and other Indian service providers report that they are unable to access TikTok. ISP said that they had not blocked TikTok, but that the app itself had shut down access in the country. India's Department of Telecommunications has ordered ISPs to block TikTok with immediate effect. The company has also gone from app stores, although other Chinese apps ordered removed by the Indian government remain available, suggesting that TikTok itself pulled the app. The governments of India and China are in a dispute over border conflicts in the Himalayas. Amazon announced it will bring the game Crucible back into closed beta at 12 Eastern on July 1st. Those who joined uh, before they can, uh, I'm sorry, those who joined before then can play in, in Steam, but there will be scheduled sessions with developers joining for feedback. Qualcomm announced two new Wear OS processors today, the Snapdragon Wear 4100 and the Always On 4100 Plus. Qualcomm promises 85% faster speed than the previous generation, two and a half times faster GPU performance and faster memory. First watches with the chips will arrive in the coming months. Google confirmed it has acquired Canadian smart glasses company North. The North staff will work on Google's ambient computing future. North's Focals 2.0 has been canceled, and support for Focals 1.0 will end on July 31st. All North customers will be refunded the full amount of Focals purchases. You may see benchmarks for the new ARM-based Apple Silicon floating around. Mac Rumors reports they seem to be coming from benchmarking software run on developer transition kits containing a variant of the A12Z chip found in iPads. This is not expected to be the, chips, the chip used in Macs. Other things to note, if you look at these benchmarks, the benchmarking software seems to be running in emulation, and while the A12Z in the iPad has eight cores, the benchmark shows only four cores. The Black Innovation Alliance launched Tuesday. The BIA will work with organizations like Black and Brown Founders, Founders of Color, Black Female Founders, HBCU.VC, and more to create a system to support Black entrepreneurs, startup founders, and creative technologists. BIA BIA plans to build a streamlined infrastructure for black entrepreneurs to go from ideas to revenue to exit. BIA co-creator Ania Williams welcomes VC interest, telling TechCrunch, we've just built this table and you can have a seat at it if you step correct. The New York Times' sources say Uber is in talks to buy Postmates. Uber's food delivery arm Uber Eats has the second largest market share in the U.S. after DoorDash. That's according to research firm Edison Trends. Uber previously was in talks to buy Grubhub, which you might recall ended up being bought by Just Eat Takeaway instead. TechCrunch's sources say that regulatory concerns kept Uber from getting Grubhub, although publicly executives have said that Just Eat was just the better deal. However... It's worth noting that Postmates is smaller than Grubhub, and combined Uber Eats and Postmates would still be smaller than DoorDash. Android's nearby sharing feature to let users share files between Android devices quickly, easily, and wirelessly, much like Apple's AirDrop feature, is now rolling out as a Play Services beta. Android Police tested Nearby Share and notes it works for photos and videos and other shareable content like tweets and URLs. And fitness apparel company Lululemon announced plans to acquire home exercise startup Mirror. Mirror is the one that offers live and on-demand exercise classes through a wall-mounted mirror. Lululemon hopes to close the sale by the end of September. Mirror will continue to run as a standalone company within Lululemon. All right, let's talk about Amazon's new little video feature. Amazon Prime Video is launching 
Watch Party, which uh, will let up to 100 Prime subscribers view film and TV together once over the internet, uh, together at once over the internet. The feature is rolling out to US users in the browser, though it is not supported by Apple's Safari. Amazon says thousands of titles will be eligible to Watch Party and all subscribers will be able to host and participate. I continue to be skeptical that this is the sort of thing that will catch on, but certainly uh, while a lot of people are staying home, uh, whether mandated or not, people are just staying home more. Uh, this is a chance for for folks to get together and, and watch things over the internet. Uh, it is a feature that came to Twitch already. Prime, you could watch yeah. Prime Video stuff on Twitch uh, with your audience, uh, but this allows you to not have to use Twitch. Uh, this and and there's no streaming video of you involved. You you just uh, host it, and then everybody yeah. shows up in a chat room, and it shows up on the right. I mean, you guys into this sort of watch party thing? Man, I. I keep waiting for it to catch on. I, you know, I have a lot of friends who don't live anywhere near me. We're never going to get into the same living room together. So this is perfect. And, you know, we talk about watching stuff all the time. That said, the whole, you know, the watch party stuff and, and a lot of platforms offer this now. It, it, it doesn't really work because yeah, you know, everybody's busy and time zones and the whole thing. Like I want this to be a thing more than it is a thing. Although I feel like company after company keeps adding it as like, Hey, you can do this now with your friends. It's going to be really fun because you're all stuck at home. It is definitely something that should work in theory, but ends up never actually working out. And there's no real reason for it other than people just don't do it. You could totally say that time, that day, we all get together and we watch it as if we would if we were going to each other's places. And it's just, you know, it's just not the same. And even if people do it once, it seems they don't do it again. So maybe this will finally be the thing that starts it. But um, I also, I'm a little bit wary of the thousands of titles that sounds like a lot but i'm betting that the one title you do want to watch with everyone is not available in that list yeah when you're talking about a service that has hundreds of thousands of titles it's uh yeah. it's not that big of a percentage uh and just to, for completeness there is an extension called netflix watch party out there it's not part of netflix but it does work with netflix and hbo is uh has contracted a company to develop this for them so we're, we're going to see more of this well, speaking of having lots of users, Facebook told Axios that it will rank original English language reporting higher in the newsfeed and rank lower stories that aren't transparent about who wrote those stories. That would mean that either there's no byline or, in some cases, no listing of editorial staff at all. An algorithm will analyze stories to identify which one was cited most often as the original source, while the news feed still only shows stories from outlets followed by you or your friends. Within that pool, the original story is intended to show up higher. Facebook hopes to apply the feature to non-English stories in the future. Uh, Patrick, what do you think? <laughs> um <laughs> thank you for that one just, just uh, immediate punt <laughs> it's no i think it it makes sense uh, obviously you're always going to have examples of uh articles or cases where you might not want to apply the algorithm in that way but i think in general one of the signals uh to have re reliable information would be knowing who wrote it, who's behind it, and not having that kind of information is kind of a hint that maybe you don't trust it as much as you would something else. It doesn't mean, you know, don't use it at all, maybe, but uh, not trusting it as much, ranking it a little bit lower, seems like an, a, a reasonable approach to this issue. You know, when I first uh, uh, came across the story this morning, my my initial reaction was like, "Oh, it's tech meme for Facebook," because it's you know, you're it, the idea is to pinpoint, okay, where the story originate. Is it from a reliable source? You know, other outlets, you know, took hold. 
but it kind of comes back to this one. But that's not actually the way anybody who's familiar with Tech Meme, that's not totally the way that Tech Meme works because it does rely on human curators uh, to figure out not only who was first, but who has sort of the best story, the best version of this that is, you know, um, you know, it ha has the best information, you know, but the, then that other outlets have have taken hold of. So, I mean, I'm I'm all for this. Uh, the, you know, the more that people kind of understand how news is disseminated and you know how it might show up in their news feed, all the better. Um, but but focusing on AI com completely at this point, and I know it's sort of a limited rollout. Um, it sort of remains to be seen how good it is. Oh, do I, what are you talking about? Uh, Facebook relying entirely on algorithms has never <laughs> stood them wrong in the past. Yeah, never I, I, I was trying to be kind, but yeah. Uh, no, I, I think this is a good thing. It's not going to fix everything, obviously. Uh, it's probably not even going to fix most things that people criticize Facebook about, but it will help improve the ability to find out, well, who broke the story? Where did the story originate? When that's mm -hmm. a thing. Like you say, sometimes it's just a press release and everybody wrote it up uh, and there isn't a source other than, I guess, the press release. Maybe that'll bubble up. I, I don't know how they're gonna choose uh, these sources. I will point out that The Economist doesn't use bylines. Uh, that is a long tradition going back into the 19th century for them. Uh, they used to even try to hide the columnists' identities. They don't really try to do that any day these days. The columnists actually host podcasts now, so it's clear who they are. But they still don't put bylines on their stories. So that's why you see them say, or editorial staff, because The Economist is mm -hmm. perfectly trustworthy, and they'll they'll tell you who their staff is on their editorial staff page. So it's interesting the little quirks to this that an algorithm may or not may or not be able to handle without some human touch. Who wants an eight terabyte drive? Me. I do. Eight, yes, me too. Because <laughs> uh, Samsung wants to sell us one. Uh, in its announcement of the new 870 QVO solid state drives coming June 30th, Samsung announced an eight terabyte model will arrive in August. Uh, they didn't give us a price, but an Amazon page spotted by Tom's Hardware earlier this month marked it at $900 coming August 24th. So that may have been placeholder data, maybe the real data. The 870 series is two and a half inch SATA drives. Uh, Samsung says they're 13% faster than the last generation, 560 megabytes per second read speed, 530 megabytes per second write speed. And uh, you can get one that stores eight terabytes. The, they have smaller ones too, but why would you care about those? Samsung says it can handle 2,880 terabytes of transfer through its lifetime, uh, which is I think the highest consumer uh, rating uh, of any drive they have. It's not the first eight terabyte uh, SSD, but it's the first consumer marketed one, the first one that, that you'll have an easy time getting just through your normal sources. Well, I mean, as, as you know, somebody who does a lot of post-production work and, and the files are big, um, I have lots of external drives. Usually they're one or two terabytes and they kind of run somewhere from 80 to hundred bucks each. So to have eight terabytes at a time for just under a thousand dollars would come in handy. Um, you know, I don't have like a, a pressing need for it right this second, but you know, if you're doing a lot of stuff where you got to back up a lot of data, um, I mean, it's so convenient to have one drive rather than eight. Yeah. I mean, you it's know, not the fastest that drive, but yeah. it's big. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, uh, price-wise, it's not that crazy. Uh, I would have expected it to be maybe a little bit higher than that. So. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's talk about printing meat. Israeli startup Redfine Meat announced it will launch 3D printers to produce plant alt steaks that taste similar to beef. The startup claims 3D printing helps mimic the structure of real muscle. Redefine Meat will, uh, I said Redfine, it's actually Redefine. Uh, meat will market the 3D printed steaks to high end restaurants this year. Next year, it will roll out in industrial printers to meat distributors capable of printing 20 kilograms an hour at a lower cost than real meat. I love this story. Uh, I don't know what it is about it that just uh, captured my imagination, but the fact that it's <laughs> it's uh, 3D printers, uh, that it's going to bring uh, this kind of plant-based meat down to a lower cost 
than real meat, which would would increase adoption. Uh, that it's it's going to maybe improve the texture. I mean, that's what their claim is. We'll wait and see, but maybe improve the texture because they'll be able to mimic that structure uh, of actual muscle uh, that goes into meat. Uh, I I feel like this is a real tech story. There's been a lot of like trying to get the the plant-based meat into technology and they showed up at CES, but it's like, oh, now we have 3D printers printing it. <laughs> I just wish these things were healthier. I mean, they are arguably healthier than real meat, uh, but they have a lot of oil in them. And, and they're, Arguably, they're the how are they healthier than real meat? Because you don't have the cholesterol content. You don't, mm. you don't, you know, uh, th there's a there's a few advantages to them, but there's not as many advantages as actually just switching to a plant based diet. Right. I yeah. Mean, I mean, the whole idea, you know, if you eat a lot of red meat, yeah, I mean, that's an issue. <laughs> if you can 3D print some alt meat that, you know, gives you the taste without the cholesterol, that's awesome. You know, it, it always comes down to, you know, someone eating, you know, a, a burger or whatever, something on their plate and saying, this either is, you know, I, I can't distinguish between the two, or it's fine, but I can tell that it isn't real, or it's bad. You know, it's one of, it's one of the three of those things. Uh, I'm astounded that in the advantages of uh, alt meat, uh, you didn't mention the ecological aspect. <laughs> it's, oh, it's I was talking like, specifically about nutritional, but you're right. There is also right. an ecological yeah. uh, benefit as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing, maybe I missed a couple of episodes in the uh, alt meat saga, <laughs> but isn't uh, ground beef is, you know, burgers are relatively common nowadays. Mm -hmm. This is actual steak, right? Yeah. So yeah. this is something that is, I don't think I've seen stories about uh, uh, marketed, coming to market steaks before. Maybe I missed some of them. That's a good question because what I see usually is uh, is the Beyond Meat burgers. I do right. believe they have some steaks. I just don't think they're very good. Uh, again, because they don't have well, that. Again, texture. that's the thing. Yeah, it's like, is it is it technically you know comparable? Yes. Is it good? That it, that's the only way that people are going to adopt this kind of thing is if it's yeah. good. Which, to be fair, this one might also not be good. I guess we we don't right. know. But uh, but burgers have come to to a point where they're a, a decent alternative, uh, even put to people who just like you know maybe they're not adorers of burgers. But I like a good burger, and I've eaten more than one I have a burger. that was plant based that was that was absolutely fine that I'm happy to eat. So if that happens with the three D printing technology that manages to create the texture of the muscle, uh, that would be pretty good. Scientists at Carnegie Mellon University developed a politeness transfer engine to automatically make North American English written communication more polite by workplace standards. The engine is similar to those used on images to convert from one style to another, like making a photo of you look like a 16th century painting, for example. The politeness engine was trained on a data set of half a million emails from Enron employees made public as part of legal proceedings. Applications could... Con uh, could include customer service chatbots or auto suggesting text in email. Support for the research was provided by Apple, NVIDIA, the NSF, the Air Force Research Laboratory, and the Office of Naval Research. Uh, I love this. Yes, we do. Why do you love it? <laughs> because, uh, first of all, politeness is a, 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 a great uh, characteristic of everything. But it's not just, you know, for having fun on a, a, a test project. It can be used as uh, potentially, of course, chatbots are great use for that. But I can absolutely imagine uh, the same way a, a, a program helps you with your grammar. Maybe it could help you with your politeness. Uh, that would improve nuance and tone is so difficult to uh to, to to transmit through written text, I think that would be very helpful if it actually works and could improve communication, online communication as a whole. Yeah, we, in a uh, an upcoming episode of Work Insanity, hosted by myself and Patrick Beja, we had a question from a listener about how to 
keep the tone in your, in your email right. And this would be the kind of tool you could use for that if this was out there to say like, hey, look this over algorithm uh, and let me know where I could improve the politeness of, of what I'm writing. It sounds silly, but we so often in written communication think one thing and people receiving the communication read another. And just having a third party check that is a, is a great way to reduce misunderstanding. I wonder if this could be used on social media. That's <laughs> why not? I mean, yeah. we have. I mean, uh, here's hoping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> hey, folks! If you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Discord posted Tuesday that it will shift its focus from video game communication to broader community creation. In practice, this means they've got a streamlined setup experience. Uh, some updated templates to make it easier to set up a Discord server, stuff like that. Just just a, a little less geeky uh, for broader appeal. Discord also said it will have fewer jokes within the app that reference games. They're not getting rid of all of them, but, you know, not everybody gets all the jokes. So they're going to broaden out the jokes, too. And that's one of the things I like about Discord is their sense of humor. Uh, and Discord says it will, quote, continue to take decisive action against white supremacists, racists, and others who seek to use Discord for evil. Uh, so there's a whole safety center they've set up. Uh, that they're going to keep working on to to help people feel like they can keep themselves safe uh, in Discord. Discord's new tagline is now "Your Place to Talk." Uh, Discord usage since the beginning of the year has risen 50% in the U.S., doubled in France and Spain, and tripled in Italy. This is a really interesting one. You know, Discord has started uh, to be being used in, as they're saying, many different fields and areas way beyond gaming. I've personally had uh, reports from people who are telling me uh, in France, they're using it for uh, classroom work, or ah. they were during the, the lockdown. Um, and of course, when you think of collaboration tools for uh, communities or companies, Discord and Slack, I think, are the two that have been in the past few years uh, taking the entire space. Um, of course, there are upcoming others, but uh, Discord and Slack are very similar. And in the case of uh, Slack, their insistence of on <laughs> on making revenue, which they achieve by inciting people to pay for the service and for additional features, uh, has kind of let I think given Discord a little bit more more space to attract people with additional features. Getting back to the thing about schools, uh, one teacher was explaining to me that they were very simply labeling voice channels in Discord, which you don't have uh, for in, in Slack if you, unless you pay for stuff, voice channels in Discord as classrooms. You know, they would give classroom numbers and students would go from one classroom to another uh, through the classroom number as their uh, classes, you know, their schedule would move through the day. And uh, these, it's just one example, but I, I really think that Discord has had this uh, user growth mentality that is a little bit early 2000s social network or early 2010s social networks and user growth before revenue. And that has given them, it's been a success for them when it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah, I mean, the whole kind of gamer aspect of of uh, of of Discord, um, it kind of reminds me of the first days of Twitch, where there, there were people who I wanted to work with, and Twitch was a good platform for certain things, and they were sort of like, wait, what? It's about video games? Like, I'm not really sure how this works for me. Discord kind of had that issue at first. Didn't have an issue with people who are, you know, gamers that use it as a platform, you know, to talk to each other about all of that stuff. But it it was a little bit of like a barrier to entry, I think, for people who weren't sure that this was something that they could use for other things. And, you know, as platforms get big, 
uh, you have to open it up to a lot of folks. So this makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, Twitch used to specifically forbid anything that didn't involve video game talk. Yeah. Discord never even did that, which no. I think was smarter because it allowed it to grow. I mean, I, maybe it's not smarter because Twitch was doing a different thing and transitioning away from Justin TV, et cetera. But, but what I think Discord did well was realize, hey, this is where our community is taking us. Let's, let's make that better for them. Uh, Slack doesn't want to be a tool for community. Slack wants to be a tool for business. So what they're doing makes sense, which is like, hey, you know, you could try it out for free, but really, if you want to make it useful, you need to pay us because we're for the enterprise. Uh, and they're competing with Microsoft Teams rather than competing with Discord. Discord is better for just an open community. Uh, and that's why I am in way more Discords than I am Slacks because Slack is productivity oriented. Uh, Discord is enjoyment oriented. And so every Patreon uh, that I'm a member of, I, I, I'm in like 20 Discord servers, just, you know, <laughs> most of them from Patreon alone. Uh, and and it is more friendlier to being able to, to just chat with people. Uh, Slack, you can do it, but you, you kind of have to, to work around their purpose. Uh, and it's really not what they want you to do. Uh, they want you to use it for, for enterprise. Yeah. And, and I hope I was, I didn't, sound too dismissive of Slack because it was actually paying them a compliment on their business approach because they actually have a lot of paying users and that's probably a good way to go if you want to be a successful business. Um, but it certainly does afford opportunities to other players in that field. And I feel like over time, um, Slack has solidified their where for business stance and Discord is kind of raking in everyone else uh, and of yeah. course there's you know teams and others i think um zoom and even google meet are interesting things that are kind of in the same space but of course they're just for conference calls and that call alone um discord provides a much fuller type of experience and service including very robust video calls now so i think it might be a um a, an alternative for many different people that don't realize it could be, and it's very smart of them to go chasing them. It seems like the nitro that you pay for, which gets you some little perks, uh, is making them enough money right now. I wonder if it can scale. I hope that it can scale, uh, yeah. because I don't want them to put major features behind the paywall like Slack does. Uh, and, and and it seems like that's working. Before we wind up this topic, though, we do need to honor our ancestors and say thank you, IRC, for paving <laughs> the way. Because uh, really, all these are just kind of like takes on IRC uh, in, in prettier packages with, with bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, IRC is still kicking out there. Don't forget about it. Hey, thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. Sometimes IRC stories show up there. Sometimes it's something completely different. <laughs> you can submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Uh, we got a good one from Gregory, who's a developer, because we've been talking recently about you know, where developers are coming from when they make the rules that they make for their apps. Gregory says, I'm a developer by profession. I can tell you that data sets are typically collected and collated by people independent of developers. Developers seldom collect data used in this modeling. A good example is weather-related data used in forecasting models. Another is Tesla's driver data collection used in improving their self-driving algorithms. An independent uh, firm group, set of sensors, or a different branch of a company will typically do this data collection and provide the data to the developers to test, to use in testing and proving their algorithms. I'm not providing a pass for these companies' lack of diversity, but I would like to make it clear that if there are gaps in the data being used to develop a technology, such as facial recognition, that is not usually the fault of the developer or development group, but a fault in the project oversight management. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, Gregory. It's it's There needs to be pressure put on the people who make the data sets available uh, to make a wider range of data sets available with with uh, with better data in them. And the developers can put that pressure on them, which is why Gregory's like, I'm not giving people a pass. Uh, but it's if the developers are trying to develop something and they only have a certain number of data sets to choose from, uh, it, you could say, well, can't you make your own data set? That's a whole other job. Uh, and it's a difficult one to to put together these data sets. Um, not saying they couldn't do that, but that would increase quite a bit the time and cost 
uh, of development. So, you know, hopefully the developers are asking uh, the data set projects out there to improve their data sets. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Michael Akins, Chris Allen, and Jeffrey Zilks. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja. You know, it's summer in Finland. What else has been going on? <laughs> Rain. Uh, it was very <laughs> warm for a few, a couple of weeks. Now it's been raining like uh, cats and dogs and other kinds of animals. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, if you like what I do and want to check out other things that I do, Tom mentioned the uh, work from home podcast, Work Insanity, which is pretty cool, 15 minutes every Monday to give you tips about working from home. And I will would also recommend you check out um, Pixels, which is a show about games. And I will be doing a spoiler full review of The Last of Us Part 2. Uh, probably tomorrow. So subscribe to Pixels now and you'll get it tomorrow. You can always support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. It's uh, where we get the majority of our money. Uh, it's why all of us here are eating. Thank you at, for supporting us at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Next week is Security Week. Uh, we're going to focus on security on next week's show starting Monday, July 6th featuring special security guests each day of the week, including Alan Alford, Mike Johnson from the CISO series podcast, Seth Rosenblatt, who covers technology and security, Alyssa Miller, covering topics like improving your security while telecommuting and understanding deepfakes. Uh, so be sure to tune in uh, for Daily Tech News Show next week on Security Week. In the meantime, if you have some burning questions or comments, you can email us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>